Are you listening to Cody Radio Live and Deadly? I stood at the front and wonder when my son's going to come home. I was cooked good meals and could smell it before he runs in the gate. You could hear his footprints getting harder to run in, quicker <laughs> to get a bowl or his, his tea. I'm here with Wiradjuri writer and director Jack Steele, writer of Indigenous Deaths in Custody and targeting of Indigenous youths for Unheard. It's going to be on Amazon Prime Video and a Lad Bible exclusive documentary series. Jack, welcome. Right. Hey, Norris. Thank you very much. For all the mob out there, quick uh, ID. Uh, my name's Jack Steele. I'm a Wiradjuri man, originally from Orange, New South Wales. Um, I'm currently living on Wongal Country out near sort of Haberfield area in Sydney. Um, and I've been sort of directing and uh, producing and writing TV and film and content for probably over 16 years now. Episode one, Indigenous Deaths in Custody. It's pretty full on, brother. It's pretty, it's pretty full on, hey? Part of kind of doing this, the sort of the press round on on the series is kind of a way trying for me to try and uh, to try and tell people to you know just how confronting episode one is, and um, I suppose you know I, I was sort of why there's so many warnings at the start of it, just saying that this is you know it's very full on, um, but unfortunately it's sort of it's the truth of it you know, and that's kind of why these like why we went into it to tell these stories was because um because the truth is so confronting and it's sort of it needs to be told for me i was just shook up because it's it's so close to home it's like that's me that young brother that that auntie there that's mum you know for, for yeah. me and it's just like it's we know the story but now for it to to also on a on a more broader um you know scale it's it's out there for for everyone to to digest and, and understand what we're talking about now with black deaths in custody. I think there's a, a clear visual now with that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's true too. Like, it, like what you say that, you know, you know, that is you, that's, that's, you know, that's my cousins, that's, you know, my friends, my mob, you know, and we know that it's like, you know, we know these stories and stuff, but um, I think the greatest thing about Amazon coming on board and being so supportive was that, and, and Lad Bible as well was that, it allowed allowed us to no longer be just preaching to the choir, you know. Like you talk to any any of any of the mob within any of our communities around Australia, you know. Like you kind of bring this up, and everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, we know." It's like you know, that's that's, that's everyone's lives in some degree, whether it directly or indirectly. But now the story is being able to get in front of audiences from all over the world, and not just you know like white Australia, but I'm talking like you know everyone across the world. And there's going to be people that are going to be able to watch this and sort of realize that, you know, the the, de- the deaths of Indigenous people is not, or even deaths of black people for that matter, is not just an American thing or, you know, from other countries. It's also happening here and it's been happening for a long time and it's still happening, you know, especially when we think about like when we first went into this production, I think the, the um, Indigenous deaths in custody since the Royal Commission was around 400 and 400 and 13 I think or 420 something and it's now what 470 so it went up that much in the you know 10 months that we we're making the show so which was pretty heartbreaking in itself so it's not like it's something that happened a long time ago or it's happening to people that are you know um, that are deserving of this he was in the courtyard they're only allowed to our break of 24 hours of the day in the jail system is something called a buy-up system. And the buy-up's like your shop. Your family sends you money to your account. You get a little bit of freedom to buy your own snacks, to buy your own toiletries, not to just eat jail food. So, cuz I went and got some extra Jats crackers. You could see he was fidgety. What was the next move with the screws or nurses or whatever? He knew he was getting locked down. And inside, when you get locked down, you're locked down. You're in your room for how many hours you don't get told. You know, a lot of the deaths were people that couldn't pay fines or something, you know, or had been locked up for, you know, just minor, you know, spending the overnight in prison or something for minor drunkenness or, you know, I don't know whether it's minor or not, but drunkenness in public and stuff, you know. Yeah, and that's a key point, like, in that episode that our people are being hit with harsh sentencing um, 
you know, during that process of, of court proceedings, they're being hit with really harsh sen- sentences in comparison to the broader community. Exactly right. And another thing as well is that a lot of people like, you know, especially with episode one, and I think this was a thing that was was really important for me because when we first went into this, I, I really did not want to have my voice um, telling this story whatsoever. So I wanted to just kind of sit back and, and let the story tell from the truths of of David's family. David and Mum was like really close, you know, they was everywhere I saw Mum, I saw Uncle Junior, so. Like the sibling pact was, yeah, really, really, really strong one. And the love he had for his mother also, and all of us as cousins, you know, he was really biggest heart, biggest smile. The implementation of the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody has been a disaster. The federal government will tell you that they've, they've implemented the majority. Well, the statistics speak for themselves. At the time of the Royal Commission 30 years ago, the figures were as low as 14%. Now, that's bad enough. But today, 30 years after that Royal Commission, it's around 30%. Now, we should be ashamed of ourselves in this country. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody recommended that we see less people in jail, that Aboriginal people be diverted away from incarceration, and instead, it's doubled. It's really clear that when you look at the stats, you look at what they're saying, that it's, you know, that they're not lying, you know, that, that you know, people so often, you know, will dismiss um, what they're saying is like, you know, oh, that can't be right, that can't be right, but the facts are all there. And you're right, you know, they're getting hit with harsh penalties, but they're also getting hit with these really harsh stigmas. You know, like um, David, when he was, when he died, when he was killed in prison, he was three weeks away from being released on parole. You know, he'd served his time and he had, he had made up for his mistakes. And then he gets killed for refusing to hand over a pack of biscuits, which was not an illegal thing for him to have. He legally obtained them. He was allowed to have them. But for some reason, the guards and the medical staff were just like, no, we don't want you to have them. And then they storm the cell. They, not take, they don't take the biscuits. And then he, he dies because of that, right? And then the, a lot of the comments on social media were, were talking about, oh, why was he in prison? You know, why was he here? Or, you know, he was violent. He should have cooperated. As if they're kind of justifying that his death was somehow, you know, like justified because of, because he was in prison. And it's like what I was really trying to kind of portray in some of these sections was that this is a man that had made a mistake. He had gone to prison. He had served his time. But now these comments are coming through saying that, you know, somehow he died because he was he was in prison or somehow it's his fault. And it's like, so not only are you getting the, you know, the harsh sentencing, you're also getting the never ending harsh, you know, sort of criticism from from the communities, which is totally unfair. And this isn't an isolated incident. It's happening again and again. And First Nations people are bearing the brunt of this kind of discrimination and it must stop. The system doesn't want to expose the truth, which is that racism has found its way into our laws and the way they're enforced and the way people are jailed and then the way their health and and welfare is not being treated equally with other Australians. It's one of those things like us blackfellas, we we know this story so well and it's... Yeah, like back to my earlier point, now that it's being told to the broader community, hopefully there's some more deeper and, and more meaningful understanding of what we are talking about with Black Lives, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Deaths in Custody, whatever you want to label this, yeah, like here now is a clear description of that. And yeah, brother brother was in, in jail for a reason and, and we acknowledge that, but there's also processes and practices that are not being handled correctly and that demonstrates that in episode one totally and you know and, and, it, and the fact that the fact that it's like disproportionate when, when you think about these processes and stuff that have been hand like you know put in place and they say there's all you know these there was process or there wasn't process or there was training or there wasn't training i mean you watch that episode and you go i guarantee you if he was a white fellow that wouldn't have happened you know like they would have talked him down they would have you know handled it totally different and you kind of see that with you know, um, the way, like all the CCTV footage that, you know, you kind of watch at the start of that episode as well, that little montage at the start, you're seeing just how violent and, 
aggressive that Aboriginal people are being treated, simply just being brought in for processing. You know, it's, it's so full on. And I, you know, I think what will happen when people watch this finally is that I don't think that anyone in their right mind will be able to watch this episode and be able to deny those facts anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel the same way is you see the, the, just based on the vision and how it is presented, you only see it from the moment they storm in into the cell. And I see, you only see it from a certain perspective. But what, what was happening to, to David beforehand? You know, what was happening in the lead up to all of this, you know? And yeah, that's that for me is also a, a huge factor as well, which I think, you know... Um, is touched on as well. Yeah, well, I think it was really important too because I said to I said to um, the family when we were speaking with George Newhouse, you know, at the National Justice Project, I said, you know, like we only know, like we said, you know, we only see the, the footage that they, you know, that the media had reported on. But then when you get to sit down and you get to actually understand what happened and what they talk about at the coronial inquest, uh, you start to realise that there is a picture here that, doesn't fit with you know, the the reaction to the IAT team still in that cell, and I think that was really important to kind of touch on because you know, like you said, it's easy for us to just you know for people to kind of see that that first couple of minutes and just think, oh, you know, it's a violent inmate, but it wasn't the case. It wasn't actually like that. He wasn't violent, you know, until the point when they stormed his cell. And I mean, you know, fair enough. If you've got eight or how many officers there are that come in and storm your cell, you're probably going to be a bit reactive. Absolutely. So I think it was really, I think it was really important to kind of really touch on that truth and just show the before, but also the aftermath. You know, like using the experts. Like we weren't allowed to use any more footage once David had passed away, which I think, you know, looking back on it now, I think is probably a, a smart thing to do because I think it'd just be very, very traumatic to the family. But we were almost not allowed to kind of talk about it because of. You know, there were so many loopholes we had to kind of get through to kind of work out what we can share and what we can't. And I think we, you know, we did it right and we did it with with um, authenticity and respect. But when you finally understand what happened afterwards and then you understand what happened with the coronial inquest and the investigation and stuff, I mean, it just paints this picture that the system is built on purpose to be um, discriminatory against blackfellas. And, and it's it's really full on. So I hope that when people watch it, that they understand it is full on, but that, you know, they respect that this is a story that needs to be told. The immediate action team, what I want you to do is come to the door, yeah, place your hands right. through the hole. Thank you. As you're going to be cell moved and you get handcuffs on and moved, do that now or force may be used. Do that now. And then they stormed David Sill. One, two, three, go, go, go. First thing they do is hit him directly across the face with the police shield. Then they scuffle and wrestle with him. And they finally manhandle him enough with power of five, six big heavyweight men. If they were so worried about him breathing, why didn't they listen when he was telling them, I can't breathe? One of our young men his life being taken from him, you know, it's, that's for me, that's the hardest thing. I, I, hearing the facts and, and hearing immediate family stories and mum's story, um, that's heartbreaking. But the vision in itself, like that is an act that's, that's being played out. So, I mean, was that just in itself, that playing around with that idea in your head and creatively how to treat that with the utmost respect and sensitivity was, was that challenging? Yeah, like I think, I mean, I still, I think I still kind of, in a way, I'm still, like I'm thinking I myself, I'm still healing a little bit from having to, because I, I edited these those episodes as well, episode one and four. Um, and so sitting there having to go through that footage over and over while you're putting the film together, I mean, the episode together, is quite a traumatic experience. But I had to keep telling myself that, you know, this is traumatic, but imagine what Latona and Paul and the rest of the family have been going through for years, you know, and then they had to sit there in the inquest and go through all of this as well. And so I just had to keep telling myself, you know, I was doing this for the, the right reasons, doing it to, you know, to help bring justice and stuff. And Latona and, 
And Paul would always call up and just check in with me because I knew that it was tough. And it was actually to come to that idea of actually showing that footage was something that I sat down with Persona and, and Paul and the rest of the Dungay family and just said, look, I want to use it, but I won't if it's going to be traumatic. And I think it was Latona actually was the one that said, no, I think people need to see it because if they don't see it, then they're not going to know it and they're not really going to understand it and they're not really going to, you know, really sit with it and see that it was totally, totally uh, inexcusable and, you know, it could have been prevented. And so when we sat down and we're kind of like, you know, we're going to show this footage and we're going to treat it as such and we're just going to have it sitting there as, as it is so that people can really sit with it. I think, I actually think it's, it's probably the, the only way that we could have told the story, you know? Hold him face down in what's called a number four leg prone position and he starts telling them I can't breathe. They instruct him that as long as he's talking, he's breathing fine, stop resisting, listen. There's no real scene about removing biscuits. And then they do move him to another cell. How has the reaction been uh, to, to screenings and to people that have seen the episodes so far? I mean, I think it's, you know, I guess you kind of, kind of guess, you know, you're watching, you're watching and you're hearing somebody die. It's pretty, um, it's, it's pretty traumatic. And I think when everyone's finished the episode, I mean, I don't think I've, I don't think I've met anyone that's been able to watch the episode and not cry. I mean, I still watch it when I, I still cry when I watch it, but, it's um, I think once that initial sort of shock is kind of worn off and you can sit with it for a bit and you sort of sit with the facts and you understand the you know the reasoning behind it and stuff, you kind of you know, I think nearly everyone I've I've shown it to has just been you know really really one like sad and 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 and, and empathetic to the family, but two really being asking questions about what's happening now, how can we get involved and and people wanting to you know, look into, you know, the next steps and of the Indigenous deaths in custody. Is there going to be another Royal Commission? All that sort of stuff. And so I think I think it's doing what it's meant to do and that's to, one, spark conversation, two, to show without any undeniable um, doubt that this is there is a really, really big systematic issue here that needs to be solved. Um, and I think people are actually starting to kind of then take it a bit seriously and start looking at ways that they can help and get involved, even if it's just simply continuing the conversation. Episode one, Indigenous Deaths in Custody, which we're, we're touching on now, 3% of the national population, 14% of the prison population in 1991, 29% in 2020. We've been speaking about stats for years, um, but also the the episode touches on policies and how racism is truly embedded within um, Australian culture. And that's true. And I mean, I think what a lot of people, I mean, those facts and those those statistics shocked me when I first started trying to dig into them because there was a lot of, I think the hardest thing that people, well, one thing that people need to understand too is that these facts are so hard to find because there are so many different um, bits of context that change the statistic number, you know, and, and it's, so, it's so hard to be able to find the true figure because you have to kind of look at the context in which the figures are being spoken about. And so a lot of the time the government will put up figures and they'll say, oh, it's actually dropped here or, you know, it's actually less here, it's less here. But they're talking about things within very specific and niche context. Mm-hmm. But when you look at it as a whole, it's getting worse and worse every year. Yep. You know, like you said, it's it's fourteen percent in you know, nineteen ninety one, and then now it's twenty nine percent. Another one that was really like shocking to me was that in the Northern Territory, almost one hundred percent of juvenile detention are Aboriginal people. Almost like that's that is insane to me. You know, and then when when people kind of ask, oh, well, then why is it? It's not because people are literally writing policies and they're saying go and arrest black fellows and throw them in jail because they're black. It's the, the internalized um, and systematic racism that gets brought up through the people and the perceptions of Aboriginal people, I find. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the one also the harsher sentencing where they, they kind of factor in things like poverty as neglect or, you know, the fact that there's a, a, a 
dismantling of government, um, you know, what do you call it, social, social welfare policies and systems that mean that, you know, places like the Northern Territory, when those things are getting defunded, there's no one around that can kind of help them uh, through things. So then they just get sent to prison. And then because there's a backlog in the, in the, in the sentencing system and in the courts, you've got all these people on remand and it's just like, it just snowballs from there. And then, you know, then that then bleeds into the medical system. So, you know, in places like far North Queensland, where there are, uh, you know, so many cases where there have been people being turned away from, from treatment because they're perceived to be, uh, or they're not being taken seriously, or they might be perceived as having drug addictions or something like that. And then it later turns out that, you know, they've actually got, had medical conditions that needed help. I mean, it, it happens everywhere and it's not just in prison, you know. I mean, school is another one as well. People getting, not being accepted to school because they're black or, you know, not being uh, treated seriously when they might have some issues at home and instead just being suspended or expelled. I mean, it's just an absolute catalogue of, of systematic racism that goes far beyond what people might perceive as, you know, just black and white. You touched on education and, and that sector. Um, episode four, the targeting of Indigenous youth, also touches on these themes. Um, do you want to tell us about that episode? Yeah, so that episode is, is all about is the targeting of Indigenous youth. And like I said, it's not just targeting from police, but it's also, you know, how do people, how, how do kids kind of go fall through these cracks and get into these systems and ultimately end up in prison? There's an actual pipeline, they call it the school to prison pipeline or the you know, the, the care to prison pipeline. And it can be things like, you know, having, uh, like we said, you know, people uh, perceiving families that are that are poor as being neglected, but they're not. They're actually just broke, you know. And so they'll, uh, they'll be targeted by social welfare. And then when there's disconnection from their families, they then become disconnected at schools and they get suspended or expelled. And then they get put on the street and then there's, you know, they might be, running away from foster care and then they get into trouble, then there's nowhere to put them. So they get sent to prison. And then once they're in prison, like even if it's juvenile prison, it's much easier to then be institutionalized and then put into adult prison later on. And so episode four kind of touches around that through the eyes of Keenan Mundine, who now runs Deadly Connections with his wife, Carly. And it's like a really, really, I uh, guess like shocking insight into his life because he's literally gone through every single one of those stages and it's not, you know, it's, it's something that's not, uh, what would you call it? It's not uh, uncommon, I guess, so to speak. And so we talk about that and we also talk about, uh, you know, the death of TJ Hickey and Redfern um, and how all of that kind of, you know, the riots in Redfern, all of that, all came about through like kind of through Keenan's lens and through his eyes and stuff. And so it's a pretty, um, again, it's a pretty, it's a pretty shocking one to watch as well, because I think the majority of the, the stats and facts around the treatment of Aboriginal people in Australia come through that episode. It was um, very, very hard as a child growing up in that community with no sort of funds, no money, no resources. Not long after losing my mum, um, my father was found hanging in a car park. When I, when I lost my mum and dad and I was taken from my community, I was taken to a new school that couldn't accommodate me. I was in year three, housed in the kindergarten room. I'd go onto the playground and I'd get teased because I'm an Aboriginal kid from Redfern who should be in year three, but I'm in the kindergarten room a theme that's coming out and I'm, I'm going to ad lib <laughs> during the interview and I think wh one theme that stood out it's like we spoke about corrections and and that sector but now moving to education and more the social side of things I think the theme that's coming out it's there's social traps for our people that would be the the I guess the the common theme that that that's coming out of this that that there are social traps out there for our people that are embedded within policy and law. Totally. I mean, you know, like I think you're right. Social traps. I think that's a great way of kind of um, describing it. I think because 
um, you're right, you know, like, and it could just be simply something like, uh, you know, the way that uh, Aboriginal people, like if they're on welfare and they've got kids and stuff and, you know, they're, they're struggling to get by, but then simply being put into public housing in an area that's, you know, not being looked after automatically puts them into like a, you know, a, a risk of having their kids taken away simply from just being put in that area. That's totally not up to them, you know. So those social traps are real. I mean, look, think about Redfern, for example, and down at Waterloo. Those areas are a great example of that. Yep, and even even further out west, if you, you want to look out west to, you know, out on Durham country out there a little bit further where we have one of the largest totally. youth concentrations in the country, you know. Um, yeah, which, you know, I was lucky enough to spend some time out there in the Druitt and do some work out there with the with all the young followers out there. So um, I mean, you're right. And it's like you look at look at that, look at how Mount Druitt has been has been um, you know, sort of over policed much like Redfern was, much like a lot of places all around the country are, you know, and it's like simply these social traps that they get set up and then there's, you know, there are these really dodgy policies and then, you know, there's very heavy handedness that happens. I mean, it's kind of, it's going to happen and it's going to keep happening unless these systems kind of get broken down. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, spending, you know, the last 15 years, you know, coming back to broadcasting now and, you know, but spending that time in education, it, you know, the intentions there, the, the you know, I guess what the department tried to do and, and, and all of that sort of stuff, but there needs to be more consultation to to ensure that there's higher success with our people, with our, with our young people graduating school, not just transitioning into traineeships and pilot programs or, you know, boys and girls academies. It's, it's more than that. It needs to be, there needs to be more of a deeper connection in community, I think. Totally. I think, I think, and the only way to do that is by, you know, community led and, and mob led programs and stuff, you know, like Carly says this really great thing. It's like, if you want to change, you know, you need to listen to us. You don't need to, you don't need to stop. You need to stop telling us what we're going to do. And you need to start listening to what we need, you know, what we need because she's right. You know, like you can't have, you can't have this problem fixed by the people that actually created the problem. It's got to be fixed by us. And it's got to be fixed by community. And I think, you know, it's not going to happen until we we pull back the police and we start investing more in social services that are community-led, mob-led, um, that have uh, like a really clear view on creating jobs and creating wealth and creating futures, not just creating certificates and trainees and, and that stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And Jack... Um, what has been the biggest surprise for you um, from the process uh, from the project? Uh, the biggest surprise, you know what? And I think, look, I, don't, look, I hope that I hope that this doesn't come across um, negative or naive in any way. But I actually think the biggest surprise to me was just how how big the problem was and how little I was aware of it before going into the project. I knew it was there, right? As we all do, but I, I was so, I was actually surprised that even I was quite naive to a lot of this stuff. And so I think that was probably the biggest surprise, but I think if you're probably looking for something that's like, what was, what is the thing that I've been most proud of? I think it's been the fact that I've been able to be trusted by the people that, that are stories are in this, in these episodes and that they've, they're happy with the way that that I've helped them tell their story, I guess. I think that's probably been the thing that I'm most proud of. Deadly. Brother, thank you. That's so good. No worries, man. This is Adam Goods for Curry Radio. This is Dave Laurie from Yago Bunjalung. Hello, I'm Bradley Hardy. I'm from the band Shindy. I'm from Brewarna. Hi, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mitchell. And we're from Bow and Arrow. Hi, this is Brendan Thomas, and you're listening to Curry Radio 93.7 FM. My name's Bill Wally. Curry Radio.